Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Film Revision. Over the past few months, many of you have emailed us asking us how we have compiled the, the list of the 25 films that we'll be discussing over the course of the year. Well, they come from a variety of sources, the Oscar-nominated films from 1983, um, the top grossing films of that year, as well as the New York Times top 10 list. And from those sources, I think we put together an eclectic cross-section of films representing that year. Uh, some of the films, however, uh, uh, have not survived the test of time as well as others, and some of them even I had not heard of before starting this project. Um, today's film for discussion, Cross Creek, is one of those films. Our guests for the discussion today are uh, one of the most talented actors in the nation, Gabe Silva. Uh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who lives in the Washington Heights area of Manhattan, as well as our third teacher to join us on Film Revision, Lisa Merowitz, who uh, also lives in Manhattan. Now, Gabe broke the rules and already sent me an email with his uh, <laughs> thought, rather ineloquent thoughts on the film. Yeah. Uh, so, Lisa, why don't we start with you? What did you think? Well, it wasn't the normal type of film that I would watch. But there were some parts that I appreciated okay. about it, um, these strong feminism overtones. And I liked Mary Steenburgen. I thought she did great in the movie. I actually feel like Mary Steenburgen is, is the weakest performance in the film, but, I, but I'm gonna get back to that. Um, Gabe, you wanna sum up your email to me? Uh, I hated this movie <laughs> with, with a sincere passion. I, I actually think your email said, boo! <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right, you're right. But you know, it's funny, I do, I agree with you. Mary Steenburgen is the, the weak link in this. I mean, a, a plank of wood would have been more compelling. Uh, in Wait, the, she, I think she has a good scene or two, but uh, yeah. and I, I have a lot of respect for her as an actress. I feel like there are other performances in her career. I mean, notably, you know, Melvin and Howard, Back to Future Part 3. I mean, it's, it seems like a series of incidents that well, she's kind of involved with, but why, it's not about because her. Because it's such an un, you know, known quantity, this film. Lisa, how would you describe this film to the person if you could have to sum it up? She is a typical suburban housewife who decides she wants to change her whole entire life and move to the Florida Bayou, become a writer, um, work on her, her novel, and abandon her husband. And so... I mean, I, I, I think she was a writer before then, just an unpublished writer. I think she, okay. was, she was trying yeah, she to be a writer. She was successful until... Um, she was an unsuccessful writer. And historically, apparently, she's important because she wrote The Yearling. And that right, is, yeah. uh, and that's her most oh, famous right. novel, uh, which I actually had never read. And I, during the movie, one of my notes I wrote down is, why are they spending so much time in this deer storyline? Then I realized, <laughs> <laughs> I realized oh, wait a I didn't even make that connection either. Uh, okay. Yeah. I have right. no idea. Was Jacob Ladder a really? Yeah, a, yeah. Okay. I mean, the, I the, the, yearling, the yearling was her, was her big, I mean, okay. it was made into a very successful that. film. I did make a note about the feminism because I thought it was interesting. And as a feminist, role model, Rawlings is, is, is a little shaky. I mean, I think she has intentions of being a feminist right. person, but, but she's not, you know, over the course of the film, those convictions seem to break down. I don't know, like, if there's a point there or not. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about the movie, and, and I really was struggling with some kind of, of thematically, what this movie's about. And um, I think that, you know, the crux of it is between Marsh, uh, played by Rip Torn, right. and... Uh, and Mary Steenburgen's character, and you know, I think Marsh typifies that kind of uh, you know, like a southern gentleman, but that, but he also is a man's man, kind of gruff, you know, uh, you know, living off the land kind of thing. And I think his death is significant in that it's it's kind of like the death of that kind of ideal, you know. I mean, he's certainly a little more accepting of, of Rawlings' feminism, or yeah. attempts at feminism. I was surprised by how accepting he was. And, and by contrast, the Jacob's Ladder character of Tim, you know, was like, I don't, you know, a woman shouldn't touch those things, and you right. know. That was a pretty good accent on my part. That was really good. <laughs> that was like Southern Georgia. I think I might yeah, have played like Tim. Yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> In the stage musical version. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I particularly liked uh, several uh, of your songs. Uh, <laughs> I'll take my bride and leave, you know, things like that. <laughs> the thing that I thought you were interesting you said is that the crux of it is is about Marsh, uh, Turner, and... Uh, Rawlings. Yeah, Rawlings, yeah, yeah. Rawlings, Marsh, Rawlings. And I don't think that's true at all. I, I, I mean, but, but I think what it points out is what I think is the larger problem of, of the film, and that is its um, disjointedness. The vignettes, the episodic nature of the film um, I feel like was more of a flaw than an asset. Yeah. Uh, because the, the, all the little stories 
it's not enough to really like add up to something. They're establishing all these stories like back to back to back and, and then they all like go in their separate directions and it, it, it doesn't feel cohesive enough to mm. really you know, feel, have an emotional impact. Well, that's, that's what I was saying. It's like when I was struggling to find some sort of yeah. through, line, through line, that was the only one I could come up with. I mean, it, it is so episodic, as you say, that it's difficult to focus on any one story. Well, they spent, I mean, I think part of that is they spent so much time on that deer, uh, and which frustrated me at the time, not remembering who this character was. It's funny that they don't mention the yearling at all in the, in the, in the film, because they feel like that would be significant. Otherwise, the deer storyline felt superfluous. Uh, the storyline that I sort of connected to more, or wanted to connect with more, is, is the romance with Norton Baskin. Their romance is so oddly constructed. Uh, I, I felt it starting, but then they're, like, they're in bed. Like, they're like making out before they even get to know each other. And I, and I yeah. feel like that's because they ran out of time. Well, chem chemistry is a big part of it. Do you feel that they had chemistry? I don't think they did. I didn't feel they had a lot of chemistry, and I definitely felt their whole relationship was forced. One minute they're in bed, the next minute they're having this fight that seemed to come out of nowhere. So. Out, of, out of her like weird feminist stubbornness. Yeah. Uh, which well, is, isn't fleshed out enough for to warrant that kind of reaction. Agreed. You know, just, uh, right. Just, exactly. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and uh, and so instead of becoming like heroic and feminist, she just appears moody and, and nonsensical. You know, exactly. What about what about some of the other actors? It's, there's a lot of them. <laughs> sure. So many stories. Alfrey Woodward. I thought she did. Alfrey Woodward was awesome. So like that was, that was the performance for me. Really strong choices. Really strong work. Um, In a lot of ways, more awesome. touching than the deer storyline, yeah. I felt. Like, yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. it was a I lot. I, and I did love their relationship. Now, Rip Torn, a, a pretty good performance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, did, he does make a career out of uh, bellowing. A lot, of, there's, there's a lot of bellowing and hot air and, you know. <laughs> and I mean, like, he's always making unique choices. But sometimes, for me, there's just, like, too much uniqueness. You know what I mean? Like, I almost, I almost want, like, the expected line reading. It, it's like Christopher Walken or Rip Torn. You know, it's, you're, gonna, you're, you're paying for a, a certain quirkiness. I, I liked his performance. I thought he really portrayed that at, back out woodsy type uh, personality. But he also had uniqueness brought to the character because it was unpredictable at times. They sort of skimped over a lot of, uh, a bit of Rawlings uh, character in life. Apparently she was a really heavy drinker. Oh really? And, like they're, well, I thought they was. included that. Every time they had coffee, they were getting wasted. Yeah, but I mean oh, like she was never like, that never showed in her in her character personality. She fell in the they mind. Showed... She shot the pig. That wasn't after drinking. That was after like waking up. She was drinking. That would have made her so much more compelling. I think. Yeah. If they would have added that because I mean, I mean apparently Parker, it was there. It got lost in all the yeah, divisions of their got... story. Yeah. So real quick, uh, closing thoughts. I was glad I saw the movie since it wasn't a typical thing that I would watch. It's a new experience. Um, and interesting to hear your take on it since I didn't know anything about the Rawlings character. But I, I did appreciate the feministic parts of it and some of the performances, especially Woodward. Did you feel it was half-assed in its feminism? Did you, feel it, did you want more out of that aspect of it? I, or was it's that, a, it's, it's I felt when she agreed to marry him that it kind of lost some mm -hmm. of that strength. So, yeah. I did feel like we, like we were watching a feminist story and then I feel like it was slowly breaking down and I wasn't sure what I was supposed to take from that. You know, I think that for the time period, there are, there are better subjects. Um, I think that there are better, better movies about this kind of like city mouth, mouse, country mouse thing. And I think there are better movies about feminism. I think it just strikes out on every kind of point it tries to make, you know. It just doesn't get there. It just doesn't go far enough. And uh, the story just is really difficult to, um, to, you know, to understand as a cohesive whole. It's unfortunately a little scattered. So um, this, was a, this was a really hard movie to discuss. So I, pre I appreciate you guys um, coming out and meeting the challenge of discussing Crossery. Gabe and Lisa, everybody. Hey. Um, if you are interested in sitting up here and being similarly challenged um, and want to be a guest on Film Revision someday, send us an email at info at myriadarts.net and uh, we'll see about getting you on the show and you can come and talk about a film from 1983. Film Revision will return in a few weeks with a brief trip back to 2008 where we will talk about a TBD current theatrical release. Uh, thanks very much. We'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.